thank you very much for joining us for this uh, third meeting of a row in Chorus 3D. Uh, in the first meeting, we discussed the records for Chrome Guided Smile, uh, all the different uh, variation, <coughs> excuse me, variations that people present, dentures, edentulous, partially dentulous, partial dentures, there's all kinds of ways patients uh, arrive to the office ready for Chrome. And the records are not complicated, they're all um, you know, standard dentistry. So we went through records, and then last week, uh, we went through the, uh, the first step of a surgery, which is a pin guide, and then the fixation base. And the next step, which is tonight, we're going to talk about the osteotomy guide and the carrier guide. And I was playing these videos right at the beginning during, uh, during our warm-up to just to show you, give you an idea of what the products we're going to, or what the components we're going to talk about tonight. In the top left, that plastic device there is called the carrier guide. And in that video, the doctor is using it early in the process just to make sure enough bone reduction was completed. So the, the fixation base is, is, uh, is in, the teeth are out, the bone's reduced, and the doctor will try in the carrier guide. And if it fits passively, then you know that the tissue and the, and the bone has been, uh, the bone's been reduced to the right level and the tissue's been reflected and that uh, the components, the stackable parts of chrome will now fit in passively. The bottom left is, I guess it's kind of obvious, that's the osteotomy guide. Um, this particular system that's being shown here is a Megagen system. You see there's no spoons. This is just a drill uh, that is placed through the osteotomy guide. It, it's actually a very nice system. Uh, Megagen and MIS both have drills with large hubs that meet the inside of our osteotomy guide. It's kind of neat. Most of the rest of them have a spoon system. And then on the right-hand side, that image, that's a carrier guide placed in um, later after the implants are in, and then it's used to orient and place the multi-unit abutments uh, in the right um, orientation. Uh, index to the implant, which we'll talk about all these topics quite a bit tonight. Um, br just real briefly, uh, each one of these programs, just like to mention the fabrication um, uh, facility in the United States, uh, which is Rodental Lab, that's Chorus 3D's partner, uh, as mentioned you know, in the first two uh, videos, and, and a little bit here is uh, you know, Chorus 3D is our partner in Ireland, and they are serving uh, major parts of Europe uh, with Chrome Guided Smile. They're a wonderful partner. Uh, they, they, they know what they're doing. Um, please depend on them support, for their support for records, for surgery, for cheer side, for anything Chrome, they're, um, they're the support for it. So just more images of our facility. Um, just like with the last meeting, I'd just like to read this little paragraph introducing what Chrome is just real quickly. It's a pre-planned surgery that starts with a smile simulation and ends with a predictable method of delivering the final restoration. Chrome delivers bone reduction guidance, osteotomy guidance, implant control, abutment insertion, and a very simplified prosthetic conversion for the surgery, as opposed to uh, denture conversion. We simply just load a prosthetic and pick it up 15 minutes. And then a very simplified method of converting to the final restoration. That's capturing the second pickup of surgery, the rapid appliance. And that is one of the biggest keys to uh, the reason to use Chrome Guided Smile is because the prosthetic you deliver at surgery uh, is picked up twice. And the second one is sent to uh, Chorus 3D for a final restoration. And we'll talk about that uh, next week, how that happens. So, for this program, we're going to talk about these two items, the osteotomy guide there on the left and the carrier guide on the right. I think, the, I think again, the, the, item, the item on the left, the, uh, the osteotomy guide is pretty clear what it does. It controls the drills uh, to, to drill out the osteotomies. And then in most situations, it also controls the implant. And I say that because that's a very important thing to know. And we'll have a few slides on that later. Uh, but for every system, it controls depth and trajectory of the drills. And on the right-hand side is the carrier guide, and we discussed that a little bit, and we'll go into detail about the osteotomy guide, all the, the traits of it. So the, the osteotomy guide, <clears throat> forgive me, I think I said osteotomy guide, I meant the carrier guide on the right. So the osteotomy guide <clears throat> is what manages the guided kits. 
in order to in order to complete a chrome case there's really two main components that a doctor has to have or the implant company has to have they have to have multi-unit abutments and most companies do now and they have to have angled multi-unit abutments but they also have to have a guided kit um, I, with, with other types of guides i know you can do a sleeve and sleeve um, you can do pilot drills and freehand the rest uh, with chrome it has to be with a with at least with a guided kit and then it helps to have a fully guided kit and we'll we'll uh, go through the differences between those in a little bit. Uh, most systems have spoons, which we'll talk about, and some have the drills with the hubs. Talk about a couple of those. Uh, but essentially, this will control the surgery, and it will aid the doctor's experience and knowledge in putting the implants and the drills in the right place. You don't want to depend on it you know, blindly, of course, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a rigid uh, device that's made from SLM technology, which is selective laser melting, which I think in Europe most uh, doctors are familiar with this, because the, 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 that's how partial frameworks are designed now. So the osteotomy guide has several components. Um, I'll just scroll a bit with my mouse here, uh, but to to you know to fully understand the um, the osteotomy guide. It's, it's nice to use the um, it's nice to use the terms that we use. Uh, so, for instance, the blue uh, the blue um, uh, plungers here we call them chrome locks. That's part of the fixation base. Uh, we call the part that goes down into the the chrome lock that's just called a loop. Uh, this is the this is the osteotomy guide. There's a little nub here. If it's an angled implant, and this is how you control the timing. These little squares. Uh, for many cases, and actually probably uh, doctors watching this video, they received an osteotomy guide with a hex on it. And we, we did away with the hex uh, for a number of reasons. And you know, one of the reasons is not all implants have an internal hex. Many have a uh, trilobe or they have uh, uh, eight, si uh, eight sides, 10 sides, 12 sides, there's different internal dimensions. And so a hex was a little misleading. So instead, and we'll, we're going to talk about this a little bit more in the, in the program, but instead, this little nub here, this little square, that will uh, indicate how to line up the implant holder on your handpiece uh, with the right uh, rotation for the implant, so that it's in the right rotation for indexing the parts. Uh, one of the most important things is that it fits into the fixation base correctly. That's why I put flush uh, where these two come together. You know, they, they will be sent, in fact, um, probably should have had the arrow point this way to the right-hand side, but the osteotomy guide and the fixation base should be flush. If there is a little bit of play in it, it's, um, it, it's not the end of surgery, um, uh, but we, we and Core 3D make, uh, make every effort to make this, uh, um, the two pieces flush together that we know they're in the exact right place. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the inserts on the top right. Uh, in the osteotomy guide, those blue and yellow inserts, that's for a biohorizon system. Some systems allow us to do, uh, to, to fabricate the osteotomy guide that accepts the spoons or the drills without an insert, but some require an insert uh, for the timing, for the, you know, for the little notches and also just a, a more machined uh, fit. Um, Just think there's anything else on this slide well one one thing that's very important is that when you receive your case that you take your your spoons your tools out of your kit or your drills and you test them in the osteotomy guide you want to make sure that they fit intimately now sometimes there's a little bit of a little bit of a wiggle uh, we don't make it a machine zero um, gap tolerance there has to be some space um, but the, but the, in, in the, ultimately, as long as the spoon and the hub of the, of the driver fits flush with the top of the osteotomy guide, then you know you're in the right trajectory. So going back a little bit, how, how, this, how this all starts is the pin guide, as you remember from last week, the pin guide is seated on the teeth and it delivers the fixation base. And then the fixation base is what holds the osteotomy guide. Now, when you receive your uh, GSI report, that's the paperwork that comes with the case, it'll have images, a cross-section uh, of, the, of the patient with the fixation base 
virtually seated against a bone. And <clears throat> during surgery and even testing on your white models, because we send a, a white printed model of the patient's bone, you can pin it to the bone and you can kind of analyze and study what this looks like, the relationship. Uh, because this, as we talked about before, this is floating guide technology. It's only the pins that hold the, found it, the fixation base in place. So this is an image of what it should look like in surgery. So this is the same case, left and right. Uh, this is a Strawman BLX uh, surgery. That's these little peak inserts. That's for the Strawman BLX system. But you can see that the metal is hovering around the bone just like it did in the image. So that means the metal is in the correct place, which is key because that means your osteotomy is, guide is gonna be in the correct place. So that's a visual reference. Uh, you'll also have this image in your GSI report and, and you will know that, um, uh, that chrome has been inserted correctly when the, when the images match what you see in the mouth. And just on a side note, and maybe, maybe James, if you wanna make a note uh, at the end, to discuss this, quite often, right in the middle of surgery, we'll get a phone call from a doctor. And from their perspective, you can see on this image here, they'll call and they'll say, it looks like my osteotomy guide is lingual to the ridge. And, they, and sometimes it's just a panic. And the osteotomy guide will come out and they'll start freehanding their implants. But you'll find that if you insert your tool, insert a drill, and the center of this, um, the osteotomy guide will point directly down to the bone where it should be placed. The same here on, on the right-hand side. This is, the picture on the left is tilted back a little bit. I should have rotated it down more. But don't be deceived by a lingual looking, lingual appearing osteotomy guide. Uh, put a tool in it and test it and it will be in the right place. The report that I was mentioning, this, this GSI report, comes with every case. And in this report, you have these images. This is um, osteotomy guide. This is trajectory of the multi-unit abutments. This is a drill sequence. So this is a biohorizon case. And you would pick, uh, you know, drill one is a 2.0, then 2.5, 2.8 is the final, and then place your implant. And it has the implant size and what site number. And then uh, just some notes, because whenever we complete a Chrome case, we always do an online meeting, a live online meeting, and we discuss uh, uh, things that may have to occur before or during surgery, uh, extraction of a tooth, or perhaps like this reduction um, plane to sinus floor, distal number four, caution required. So there'll always be notes. So that's the GSI report. Now, we are rolling out a new uh, report, so to speak, we, we developed this um, uh, basically a form called the Surgy Mat. And what this is, it looks small on screen, um, but the left side is about 25 inches wide and 12 inches high. That will go on the wall uh, in the operatory. We can also um, send a JPEG to put on the screen. And then the other section of the mat on the right hand side. This goes on the countertop near, uh, you know, near surgery, right in the room. And let me show the little larger images. So this is the GSI report, but better because we have cross sections of each implant and it mentions what the degrees of the implant is and the abutment. It has the drilling sequence. So this is different than the, the GSI I was showing before. This is for a uh, no bell kit, uh, but you'll have your cross sections and you'll have a pan and it just has more information for you to reference, you know, during surgery on the wall. And then on the countertop, uh, this is, this is the surgery mat. And with it sitting on the counter, you'll take your implants uh, in, in their boxes. You don't want to take them out of the box for sterile reasons, but you'll place number four implant here, number 30 degree abutment here and your two temporary cylinders here and you'll fill this mat up with your parts and then during surgery it's a very simple process to grab your to grab the part that that's next uh and have it all organized and it makes uh makes surgery um go smoothly i know a lot of doctors we work with just take a blue surgical uh, cloth and a sharpie and write a tooth number and make a pile <laughs> and it works but this might be a little bit more efficient so 
This is rolling out now. It's going to mostly go with um, uh, cases where either James or us are going chair side until we have 100% happy with it, and then it'll go out with every case instead of a GSI report. So uh, the, the osteotomy guide is, it's considered, it's, it's a very precise uh, machined item. And it's not drilled, it's printed. And so when we, when we design these, we design them with a tolerance of about 0.3, uh, 0.03 millimeters uh, from the inside diameter of the osteotomy guide to the outside diameter of a spoon or a drill. And what, what that means is that it's a, you know, it's a very low tolerance. And as I mentioned before, you might have a little bit of wiggle, uh, but it should fit fairly passively. Your spoon or your drill should fit fairly passively inside of it. That's one of our checks uh, here at the lab. Uh, but before you start surgery, and I'd recommend even the day before, uh, ensure that your tools, the right spoon, the right size, fits uh, passively into the osteotomy guide. That's an important verification step. We work with many different guided kits. Uh, in fact, just about all the guided kits in, in, uh, in, in North America, for sure, uh, we work with. There's a, there's a few in Europe. I know the Sweden Martina made its way over here. Uh, there is an Alpha Bio that, that James and I, and we just started working with. Um, and if you have a guided kit and it's not on this list or it's not in, um, in, in James's list, then we can add it. It's just a pretty simple protocol. We, we want the um, specifications of it from the manufacturer that lets us know the implant, uh, the drill sizes, the implant lengths, and then the specifications of the guided kit. It's, Nice to have an actual guided kit shipped to us, but the specs from the company uh, work just as well. And then we will set up Chrome to accept that guided kit. If you're in the market for a guided kit, I would highly recommend buying one that is fully guided. And I have a couple slides on that coming up. Because um, in, in, you know, like an important part of Chrome and of any guided surgery is not just uh, not just managing the drills, but managing the implant. Not all guided kits manage the implant. They only guide drill trajectory and drill depth, and the implant is then placed freehand. So these systems on the left are not all fully guided. I, I have this slide here because some uh, some doctors and some uh, some lab partners we work with want to have an OEM sleeve cemented inside of our osteotomy guide. We make the osteotomy guide a little bit, a little bit larger, of course, so that the, that the sleeve fits in it. But they'd like to have that metal to metal fit. We charge a little extra for it. Um, you have to let, let us know, let James know when you're submitting the case if you want OEM parts. We do it standard on these on the left. That's just every, every case for Zimmer, um, BioHorizon, Implant Direct, et cetera, have these sleeves. Uh, this is just a slide to show the, the complexity of it. That drawer on the left, there's, uh, I think there's five drawers with all kinds of sleeves and spoons from companies. On the right hand side, those are all guided kits. We inventory guided kits for almost all the systems that we, that we fabricate for so that we can do, we don't actually do any kind of model surgery with the kits, but we ensure that the, that the osteotomy guides are designed specifically for the tool that you're going to use. That's uh, one, of, you know, one of our QC steps. <clears throat> oh, look at that video. And on the, on the left, these are all the different sleeves and inserts. You have to have a PhD in sleeves and, and guided surgery kits in order to work in this industry. It's quite daunting. and. and Kind of incredible how many uh, how many different systems there are out there that we have to keep track of and be um, you know specialists with. So controlling the rotation of the drills on the site. So all the systems are going to control depth and trajectory, like mentioned before, but not all are going to control the depth. And <clears throat> I have a, a list coming up of the companies that do offer uh, placement of the implant through the guide, uh, but for every 
implant out there that we plan with Chrome, you're always going to have a notch on, on the location of where the, the indicator on the hub should stop. So in other words, you're, you're rotating the implant, you're rotating it with your handpiece, and there's an indicator on every guided kit out there, whether it's a green line or a, a flat side or some indicator that's gonna say, stop rotating in this position on an angled implant so that the multi-unit abutment will be in the proper rotation with the proper um, orientation so that the temporary cylinder is going straight up, so it's going horizontal and parallel with the rest. And I'll show the significance of that in a little bit. But this is just another image of this little nub that we put on. So I, I have some images here of a couple of systems. So this is, this is Megagen, and this is also available in MIS. This is the drill. The drill has a hub. The outside of the hub is the inside diameter of our osteotomy guide. This is the old hex system I was speaking of, and now it's just a nub. <clears throat> but the, the drill will hub out for depth and angulation control. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, then there's also, so that was a drill, just cover that. That's a drill that fits in it. And then most systems have a spoon. So there's a, a guided kit that has a few or several spoons in it, depending on the implant size. And you would put the spoon inside of the chrome osteotomy guide and then the drill goes inside the spoon. That is, that is what a guided kit does controls the spoon or the drill. And then here's an example of a, of a Megagen uh, hub that is delivering a, a, a um, what do they call them? the delivery, delivery device of the implant. The green flat side is what matches up, I'm sorry, the green concave here matches <clears throat> up with the flat side of the, of the osteotomy guide, so it'll match up with the hub. And, and there's a little bit of a gap here, you see? So it's not a perfectly um, designed system, like metal to metal, putting an implant in. So it's a little bit of human guidance as well, uh, but it will, it will put the implant in the right trajectory, and then you can stop at this line here. So it also has depth indication, not depth control, but indication. So it's critically important to know the system that you're working with and if it just has an indicator if it has an actual stop uh, this is I believe this is Nobel and this is fully guided meaning that the the holder of the implant hubbed out right here on top of the um, on top of the osteotomy guide so the doctor is just going to drill all the way down until it stops and then the implant is at the right depth And then, and here, you know, here's another important part too, is that yes, they hubbed out and they got the right, uh, it came to the perfect depth, but then you'll see here that there is a little bit of a gap. And so that's why I call it a fully guided kit because it does the depth control of the implant, but still the user, the operator can still change your trajectory a little bit because of that gap, which, Actually, it can be a good thing and a bad thing. Sometimes you do want to move the implant a little bit, but I think for the most part, you want to have a fully guided kit that controls trajectory and depth of implant. You can see the gap. So some fully guided systems, uh, Strauman, Nobel, BioHorizon, MIS, Astra, and then partially guided, only controlling the drills is Ankylos, Neodent, Zimmer, and Implants. So these are all major companies, and the ones on the right those are major companies that, that uh, especially a couple of them, really focus on full arch, but they have not developed a fully guided kit, unfortunately. So on the left, fully guided. <clears throat> and right. I'm quite sure I have the slide on the right, but fully guided on the left. So that was the osteotomy guide. So let's talk next about the, about the carrier guide. The carrier guide serves a few purposes. Um, one of them is, as mentioned in the, in the very first slide of uh, the video, is that once the bone is reduced, the carrier guide can be inserted, and as long as it fits passively, 
then you know that there was enough bone reduction and that the tissue is, uh, is reflected and out of the way. Uh, a secondary, I call it a secondary use, some doctors even use a carrier guide to hold some of the tissue back. You know, usually you, you make a stitch and I'll show an image of that, but it can be used, be used for that purpose. But another main purpose is tissue gap. So from the uh, crest of the ridge, the crest of the reduced ridge to the intaglio of the prosthetic is three millimeters. That seems to be an average uh, human tissue thickness in, the, in that part of the mouth. And so we, we make that uh, three millimeter gap. And another purpose is to deliver the, uh, the, the prosthetic, uh, the nanoceramic prosthetic and the rapid appliance. So you can see, and I'll, we'll have some more images on this, but these male components of the carrier guide marry with the female part of the, um, of the prosthetics. And then lastly, and one of the most important thing is on angled implants, I'll show another image here, on angled implants, the carrier guide gives an indication of where the uh, implant screw, the abutment screw goes into the implant. So in other words, where this little notch is, this is the trajectory of the, of the implant and where, this, where the abutment screw is going to emerge uh, from the abutment. It goes into the implant. I'll show you in a, in a minute here what that looks like. The, you can see here on the left, it's kind of shadowed here, but there's a notch and then there's a, a site here where the screw goes in. So that you know that if your, your, your driver <clears throat> is placing the screw through the multi-unit abutment in this exact position, then your multi-unit abutment is in the right rotation. And that works hand in hand with the osteotomy guide. The osteotomy guide is what indicated where to stop rotating the implant, and you know you've accomplished that if the screw here goes, passes through this little notch, or near this little notch, over the notch, and then into the abutment, you know that the implant's in the right rotation. Because ultimately, <clears throat> With the implant in the right rotation and the abutments in the right place, then your temporary cylinders are uh, parallel. I'll show some images of that in a minute. Uh, this is just showing, you know, adding a stitch to keep the tissue out of the way. So you can use the carrier guide, but really the best thing, most common thing is to put a uh, stitch in the tissue and hold it back. Um, similar to um, what we talked about last week with the carrier, uh, with the pin guide, the carrier guide is plastic. And it can be a little delicate on this loop of where it goes down into, uh, into the chrome lock. So they should always be inserted passively. You don't want to remove them in a rotating um, direction. You always, always want to remove them in a vertical direction. So, remove, so undo the chrome locks, pull the little blue chrome locks out, and then lift the carrier guide straight up. And that way you cannot break off uh, the little loop. Just giving some um, you know, terminology to the carrier guide. As mentioned before, this is a three millimeter tissue um, thickness. That's the gap. Um, these are the chrome lock loops, again, to be careful with. Uh, I do mention here that holes may need to be adjusted for angled sites. Uh, you know, one of the issues with placing angled implants is the depth and uh, sometimes if it's not a fully guided kit, then the implant could be a little bit deep, a little bit shallow, and that will directly affect how it emerges, how the uh, multi-unit abutment emerges through this hole in the carrier guide. So if, if it is an angled implant, then just be prepared. You may have to make a little adjustment to the carrier guide for the conical part of the multi-unit abutment to seat. And then of course, be, you know, be, careful with these with the males on the carrier guide they're plastic they're delicate I do have a little note here there's a there's a technique if the if the bite is off where you can cut this down a little bit and then you could shim the prosthetic into place and we'll have to we'll have to have a, a lecture a course on troubleshooting situations in surgery sometime um, I know that this case here this carrier guide was adjusted prior to surgery and this doctor, and I know the technician, they like to just take the carrier guide out of the box and just make the holes bigger. Uh, frankly, I don't think that's really necessary. 
perhaps on angled sites, maybe you might want to, depending on the, uh, um, which, uh, which kind of kit you have, if it's fully guided or not. But this is an angled site, and the, uh, the multi unit abutment is you know, directly in the center of the hole where it should be. Same as this one here, right in the middle. Uh, but these straights were opened up. So I'm not 100% sure, but that's just a, a trick that that doctor does, opens it up. There's really no harm in it. Um, in fact, if, um, you know, as long as you're using our green gaskets to block out, then a little bigger hole would not, uh, you know, no harm done. But you can see here, this is, this is an issue that happens sometimes in surgery on angled implants. The implant was placed uh, a little bit too deep, and so the abutment ended up being a little bit too close to the carrier guide. If it would have been a little shallower, it would have moved a little bit more mesially, and then it would have lined up a little bit better with the, um, with the notch and the carrier guide. The rest of them seem to be in the right place. Um, but you can see there's a notch, again, wherever there's an angled implant. And we always use a little, little black Sharpie to, uh, to mark it a little bit better so you can see it in surgery. On the um, surgery mat and on the GSI report, you'll notice that the, that the surgery is going to follow the images exactly. And you can always refer back to the paperwork that's on the wall uh, to make sure that your multi unit abutments look correct. For instance, this case, um, it looks like these temporary cylinders are in the wrong trajectory because they're not parallel, they're not perfectly placed. But due to the patient's bone and the, and the difference in the limitation of either a zero degree abutment or a 17 degree abutment, the doctor chose to do zeros in the anterior and 17s in the posterior. And, and then just uh, you know, work through it at surgery. So the plan was not to have them parallel. So it's important to know the plan. I'm gonna show a plan of that case in just a second. Here's just a demonstration of putting the, of screwing down the multi unit abutment. That was kind of quick, but um, the handle is, in, is holding the MUA in place. All multi unit abutments come with a delivery handle, which should be straight up and down. This is the same trajectory as the temporary cylinder because it fits on here. And then the driver, uh, the, the um, screwdriver, goes in at this angle through the notch down into, um, into the abutment. So let me show, I, I, I kept the case open so I can show this, how the carrier guide works. So insert, this is what you'll see in surgery when you're planning a case with us. We'll have the prosthetic uh, that, that we're going to mill and deliver and we turn the prosthetic off. There's the osteotomy guide. So you can see, and this is, a, this is about two months old, so there's still a hex, but that shows that there's going to be an angled implant and the rounds are for straights. This is the case we were just showing on, uh, on the previous uh, two slides. So let me turn off the patient, leave the implant on, so now you'll see that this is a, we're looking at this implant here. It's an angled implant. And so therefore on the carrier guide, let me turn off the osteotomy guide. See the implant angle is here. The notch is right here that, that is exactly where the implant is emerging in the direction. That's the trajectory of it, the same as you can see this little gray line. That's the trajectory of the implant. That's the notch. There's a notch here. Those are both angled implants, as you can see, and the anterior two are straight. And so you'll see there's no notch in the anterior. Okay, moving on. Sometimes you'll see a carrier guide uh, where we didn't have room to do a notch because it would weaken the distal part of the plastic. You might see just where we carved a little groove. Sometimes that's by hand, sometimes it's digitally. And, oh, forgive me. So this is, these are the temporary cylinders emerging through the carrier guide. And you can see, especially on the left, that they are not parallel. And 
these were all, except for the one on the right, these were all angled implants. And the, the, the surgeon, um, I, the surgeon tried to get the rotation right. I don't know that they fully understand their guided kit. Uh, I don't think they'd used it very much. And so you end up with this uh, flared divergent temporary cylinders. And you can imagine what happens when you have flared divergent temporary cylinders. You have um, now, forgive me, I'll get to it. Sorry. What you end up with is a prosthetic that is adjusted uh, because the prosthetic is not going to fit passively. Now, there are sometimes some tricks to put the prosthetic in first and then the delivery, then deliver the temporary cylinders through the holes in the prosthetic. Uh, but that's, um, that's not the right way to do it. The right way to do it is to, when you, when you have divergent temporary cylinders, the best thing to do is to remove the cylinder, remove the abutment, and rotate this implant properly. Sometimes it's only three degrees, sometimes it's five degrees. But if you rotate it now during surgery, then you don't have screw access problems for you know, the, prosthetically for the remainder of the patient's um, yeah, use of the prosthetic, I mean forever. You're kind of stuck with that trajectory forever with multi-unit abutments. So you're, you're much better off if, if, if this, on the, on the right here, if this temporary cylinder is going to emerge through the, the, the buckle or through a cusp where you don't want it to be, rotate the implant into the proper position and then, um, and then continue with the case. Um, you know, one other thing to notice is that you, you want to make sure that the carrier guide is passive. So I mentioned before where, uh, where a doctor opens these up occasionally, you know, even before they start the surgery. If you find that your carrier guide is touching the temporary cylinder of the abutment, you definitely want to remove the, car the carrier guide, make a little adjustment here until it's passive, and then reseat. You don't want uh, any torque on the carrier guide or on the temporary cylinder. Um, and another kind of, kind of issue that used to come up uh, before we really understood cuff heights of implants, uh, of multi-unit abutments, you want to try to always order the, um, the, the same collar heights of multi-unit abutments. And that's, a, that's an important thing to know because some companies have, for instance, Nobel BioCare. They have a 1.5 millimeter cuff height on a straight abutment. But on an angled abutment, the lowest cuff height they have is 3.5. So if, you have, if you're doing an all-on-four situation uh, or if you have some 30-degree abutments and some straights, then the 30-degree abutments are protruding uh, two, two and a half, three millimeters higher than the straight multi-unit abutments. And prosthetically, that can be a problem. Uh, it, it, in, in the laboratory, we end up having to um, uh, design restorations that go over the MUAs and then back down to the tissue, kind of like a bridge over the MUA. Uh, so that's, that's critical to know. You know, sometimes you can put an implant a little bit deeper in those cases or don't always like to suggest it, but work with an implant system that has low collar heights, like uh, Neodent has 1.5 millimeters on 30 degree. They have the lowest in the industry. And most, most companies have two to three millimeter collar heights. Very important. And ultimately, uh, with, with this system, with Chrome, if you, if you know the guided kit, uh, if you understand the guided kit and, and have experience with it, this uh, Chrome can deliver an implant in the proper place every time. Uh, I think we're at 5,000 cases now. We have it got really down to a, down to a wonderful, uh, predictable system, predictable placement. So I hope it didn't cover too much information. I think I did. That's about 45, 43 minutes of uh, discussion. I'd be happy to do some Q&A. Um, at the end, I don't know, James, are you, would you like to run the Q&A session of this? Uh, yeah, can you hear me now? Yep, I can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so a couple, a couple of questions, um, uh, Alan. And the first one was about guided kits. So I think you mentioned it at the start. Um, if somebody is using a guided kit, 
what is your recommendation? What is the universal kit that you would recommend that they use? Um, and what one do you have the most experience in? Yeah. Uh, if you're going to buy a universal, in, in other words, you want to uh, perhaps manage a couple different implant systems or multiple implant systems. The best one out there is Sim, the Simplant Guide. Uh, what do they call it? The Surgery Guide? It's a Simplant fully guided kit, and uh, they will they they have spoons and tools to accommodate many different implant systems out there. That would be the best one to get involved with. Uh, if that's if your current implant company does not have a guided kit, I always recommend using the guided kit of the implant company. If for some reason yes. you don't, if for some reason you don't like it, or maybe it doesn't have um, a fully guided um, capabilities, then yeah, I would say look yeah. at the implant kit. Okay, that's fine. Um, the other one was the you mentioned it again at the start, which was new, which is the little nub on the guide rather than the hex. Yeah, because I suppose our demo kits over here and what we've seen most of has all been the hex. Um, and obviously the nub, as you've called it, is now new. Um, and is that going to be? Sorry, James, you, you cut out at the last part. Is that going to be? Is that going to be from now on? As yeah. in, so whatever cases are through now, it will be that little nub? Yes, yes. And I'm going to try to come up with a better word than nub. Uh, but yeah. I like nub. I think it's a good name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll keep it nub. Um, yes, they all, they all will. We, just, we had a lot of um, feedback about the hex and... and you know, the, 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 the real question is, do you stop on the flat or do you stop on the bevel? Because all these different systems out there have a different, I mean, it's either bevel or flat, one or the other. And so we keep track of that, but it's not something that we put on the GSI report or, you know, publish with every case because there's so many different ones out there. So instead of worrying about whether they're trying to match their flat to our flat or their, yes. or their, or their, their, their point to our flat, we just put a nub. Yeah, okay, it, it makes sense. Um, just on that point, I think it is critically important that people obey where the nub is or the notches where the on the hex if they have one at the minute that they're going to use because it saves so much time later on if you have a fully guided kit that you put your, your marker on your implant driver to that point, it's absolutely critical. Absolutely critical. And everybody will learn the hard way, which is crooked uh, temporary yeah. cylinders. And of course, yeah. you know, just a reminder, that's only on angled implants. If the implant is straight, yeah. you don't have to worry about rotation. The other thing was then a quest, couple of questions in on the carrier guide. Um, you went, but you did go over it, which was the importance of the notch. Um, right. The thing is, that if the carrier guide, when you fit the carrier guide, you don't get it to fit passively, what's that telling you and what do you do about it? The, if the carrier guide is not seating right, like for instance, this image here, and actually this, this is not the best image for it because this is a little, made a little bit differently because it's a little short. If there's a gap and you're having to force the loop down into the chrome lock, that means it is sitting on bone or tissue, one or the other. I, I, would, I would suggest using um, some kind of instrument to make sure the tissue is 100% out of the way, then reinsert it. You can do a stitch and then see if it's passive. If it's not passive, it is sitting on bone or, or there could be a piece of plastic or bone down inside of the chrome lock. Yeah. Right, so you want to make sure there's nothing inside there. As long as that's clean, spray some water in there and have, have a look because if it's if, you know, the, it, sometimes a little piece of carrier guide, the loop breaks off in there, you can't see it. And the carrier yes. guide will not see it. So it has to be fully clean. And then you'll, and then you would take your finger and a glove, of course, and rub it uh, from the fixation base across the bone to make sure there's a smooth transition. There's no little bone spears or there's no uh, raising of the, uh, you know, like a, a ramping of the bone anterior to posterior. Now, you know, the, the patient's lying down, 
And so yeah. visually you can, you can, I mean, James, you've seen this, you can, you can tell that you've reduced enough bone visually, but you could still rub <laughs> your finger along there and find something if it's holding it up. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. No, and, and certainly from my own perspective, um, it's very important that you just take your time and make sure it does sit passively. Yeah. Very important. Um, the, we have another question. If the angled MUA is not correlating with the carrier guide notch, does the site need to be redrilled? Well, okay. So that's kind of a tricky question. If usually when the, when the abutment is in the wrong position and it's not matching the carrier guide, it is usually depth. The implant is too shallow and now the abutment's hitting the anterior part, the mesial part of the carrier guide, or it's too shallow and it's hitting distal, you know, on a, a mesially angled implant. Uh, and so, so depth will cause that. If it's off um, laterally, one, one or another, at that point, I would say the, 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 you would not automatically drill a new site. You would take an x-ray and you would make sure that that implant is not violating anything buccally or lingually. And if, and if the implant's in the right place, then make sure the rotation is right. So at least the temporary cylinder is going straight up and down, and then you would adjust a prosthetic. Because an implant that's off a millimeter or two in position, but it's in the right trajectory, in the right bone, it's okay. There's no point in taking it out and moving it. So d d write it up the best you can and adjust the prosthetic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other one, oh, this is about the temporary cylinders. This is a tip from me, which is once the implants are in and the temporary cylinders are going on, to do them one at a time and check the prosthetic at each one, rather than putting on all the temporary cylinders, and then if the prosthetic just doesn't sit down, if some of you've got lots of multi-angles, um, it's then difficult to figure out which one is causing the issue. Mm. So if you do one at a time, you can see, make sure to check the prosthetic at each step. And that means that you know which one you potentially need to change or adjust. Yeah, very good idea. And sometimes if it's a short prosthetic, uh, you know, occlusal apically, then sometimes the, uh, the temporary cylinder can be inserted from the occlusal part of the hole and screwed in. And that's okay too. In other words, it wouldn't, because it's, it's, it's violating the, the hole on the, on the prosthetic, but it, but it emerges out of the occlusal, you may be able to still pass it down through the hole in the occlusal and screw it in. Yeah, yeah. Um, another question, yeah. is the Simplant Universal Kit fully guided? I, I believe it is. James, I it believe is. it is. Who, who, the person who's asking that question, the doctor's asking that question, let's get the answer for them. I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah. Okay, I'll make a note of that. Okay. Um, um, in, fact, in fact, I'll while, while we're on this, I'll text my uh, expert who ran Simplant um, for years. I'll ask him right now. Okay. Um, that's all the questions that I have had through. Okay. Yeah. That's all the questions. Um, I think, you know, from, from my perspective, um, it is critically important that it, before you go to the next step, you just on it correctly. Yeah. So you make sure your carrier guide sits passively after your bone removal. You, whenever you put your osteotomy guide on, you make sure that it's sitting correctly so that you don't carry a mistake through. I think the more and more and more that we see and do, that's one really critical part of all of this. Yeah. And I would agree 100%. And then also uh, the doctors and the team uh, should watch these videos and they can help each yeah. other during the surgery. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Mm. Well, thank you very much, James. Yes, thank you, Alan. Yeah. As See always, you next thank you. I was very. See you next, next Wednesday will be uh, the 
nano ceramic prosthetic, which we talked a little bit about tonight, how, how we deliver it, and then the rapid appliance. That's the key to the final restoration. So we'll cover those two next Wednesday. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you, Alan. Cheers. Thank you.